Yo, 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 live on location, quarantine season has begun. And we kicking it off with somebody very special to us, man. This is somebody who's top 50, Hall of Fame, whatever you want to call it, greatest of all time. And, and more importantly, when me and D. Miles first, first came in the league, he really embraced us and showed us a lot of love, man. It's our OG, the New York Nick great. Once a Nick, always a Nick. And Georgetown head coach, Patrick Ewing. Appreciate you, OG. Fellas, great to be on. I'm, I'm loving y'all. Man, you look old as me now. Remember all that trash y'all were talking about calling me old man? <laughs> I feel it, man. I feel it. Brought to you by AT&T 5G. First question we ask everybody is, when you first got to the league, who's the first person to bust your ass? <laughs> hey, look, I got my ass busted by a lot of dudes. But the first one was Moses Malone. Ooh. Moses Malone? Moses Malone. I remember. I, I, re, I can still remember th uh, that game. Um, my first uh, regular season game, we played against the Sixers. You know, I've looked up to Doc. I've looked up to Moses, you know, my whole – my whole life, uh, you know, in, in basketball and playing against these icons. And I remember the first shot, someone took a shot. It came off the board. I, I went over Moses back and then boom, dunked it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the, rest of the, the rest of the game, Moses just wore my butt out. He just <laughs> kicked my ass. Uh, I couldn't do anything right. He was just all over me. But, uh, yeah, Moses was the first. And he wasn't the last, but he was the first. Yeah, but that's, so it made you like, oh, this the this the highest level you can play on right here. Oh, yeah, well, definitely, definitely. Uh, then I mean, in my era, back in back in those days, it was a Kareem and Moses. They were the two dominant centers. Right. So I'm going against one of the one of the two. Um, it was a great experience. Yeah. So you you uh you you came to the states from Jamaica Queen when you was twelve. Yeah, I came to, uh, from Jamaica to Islands, man, not Queens. Get it right, bro. I'm, hey, I'm tell him, tell him. What are you talking about? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, Jamaica Island. I'm sorry. My bad, OG. I from the Islands. I, I'm, I was born in Jamaica. You know, lived there till I was 12. My, my family migrated to to, uh, to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and that's when I started playing basketball. Yeah. What, what type of what type of change and culture shock was that for you at twelve, coming from coming from the islands in Jamaica to to Massachusetts, a city? The weather, the weather. To I mean, right. The way. <laughs> and I know I, you hate the cold. See, I, I, see, I know how you feel about the cold. Get, you know, they ride y'all to school and all that. I had to walk, Ooh. and you know, I, and I'm 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 coming from 80, 90 degree weather to to Boston, where it's twenties or in the teens. Snow everywhere. I, I've ne I had never seen snow before, so it was a culture shock. And then, um, you know, another shock was uh, just the people. You know, uh, you know, they because I had an accent, they teased me all the time. I used to get so many fights. So you know, people wonder why I was so crazy on the court. That's because people used to always tease me. So it's either you go get punk or you gonna stand up for yourself. So I. Right. I, I Stand up for myself a lot. Mm. You uh, you went to Cambridge, right? In high school. That's when you started hooping, right? Cambridge was in Latin, but I started in grade school. Oh, um, so you started in grade school. I started in grade school. I started around twelve. But it's uh, it's funny because, like I said, I never knew basketball. I never knew what basketball was till I moved to the states, and I was on I was in the on the playground and I see these kids playing. And they wanted me to play. I'm like, I don't know how to play. I, I, I don't know the game. So that's the first time I played. And I loved it. And I just kept playing it ever since. Uh, then a gentleman by the name of Steve Jenkins saw me walking in the, in, the, in the hallways of the school. And he's like, you go to school here? I said, yeah, yes, I, 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 just, I just got here. He's like, look, I want you to come out for my team. So he's the one that first started me you know, teaching me about basketball, teaching me about Bill Russell, the Celtics dynasty, teaching me all the, the integral uh, parts of the game, how to shoot. Uh, then he took me to Mike Jarvis, who later became my high school coach. And they, they started all the, the putting the, the framework of me learning and, and becoming the player that I am today. Yeah, so, Mike Jarvis, my guy. <laughs> yeah. 
So, Pat, who would you say at that at time at that time, like along with Bill Russell, was those any of those? Were you trying to pattern your game after those guys? You know, Kareem and, and and Bill Russell, the guys that Mike Jarvis was telling you about. Well, you know, Bill Russell, because you know he was the he was the dominant man. All they kept telling me about about the, those eleven rings that he won. He, you know, he right. won like eleven rings. Plus, I was growing up in Boston, so right. I'm Celtics country. So. Yeah. Uh, you definitely wanted to to emulate your game after him, and if you if you see me back then, I was a dominant shot blocker, uh, running the floor, dunking, uh, and, and then my game just evolved from that. Yeah. In, in high school, when did you know that you was like, oh man, I'm I'm getting this basketball stuff. Like I'm I'm better than the guys that I'm starting to see every time I play. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think um, my freshman year, I had a great freshman year. I, I remember my first game. We played against Boston College High. Um, and I scored one point, and I think I fouled out in like five minutes. I was just so nervous. Um, and <laughs> Sound like a hatchet man out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> the next game, I had 28. So it all started then, and then uh, – then I remember that they had an article on me. Uh, I think I was, uh, I, I think I was 15, I was still 15, I was 15. So it said at 15, he's already a superstar. Mm. So, you know, at, at 15, uh, uh, I was about um, the same height that I am now, maybe a little, maybe an inch or two shorter. Um, you know, I was athletic. I could run, I could jump, I could block. So I, I guess at that point, uh, you know, I've, I'd already started to be recognized, but from 14 to 15 and on, uh, people started to think of me as as going to be a player that as going a uh, person that's going to be a great player. I I know it's Georgetown, but was it any way that it could have been anybody else? Was it almost anybody else? If you were to choose, yeah, UCLA was my second choice. Mm. Oh. Uh, I went, went out to UCLA uh, for my first visit. I met Kareem, I met Bill Walton, I met all the Laker greats, I met John Wooden. It, 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 was, it was ironic because it was, uh, it was, they had a night celebrating John Wooden on all, all his, his dynasty. Uh, and I'm sitting there in the room, I'm looking at all these beautiful women, I'm looking at all these movie stars, I'm looking at all these great athletes. I'm like, man, I don't LA. Know. Wait, <laughs> and it was warm out there, right? Say that again. And the weather was good. Oh, the weather was perfect. Right, <laughs> it was perfect. But they let me get back on that plane. Once I got back on that plane, I'm like, California is just a little too far. Too far, <laughs> huh? That was a long ride. So, <laughs> it was. so what was it about Georgetown and and, and, and Coach Thompson that, that that sealed the deal for you? He just hit the nail right on the head, Coach Thompson. Coach Thompson. He was, uh, I loved him. He looked like me. He, he played the game. I loved how he spoke. He spoke with class and elegance. Uh, I love, uh, DC was close to Boston, uh, uh, but far enough away for me to, to grow. I was a mama's boy, so right. I always wanted to need my mother. So I thought that I needed to get away, get, uh, and it was close enough for them to come, come to the games when they wanted to. And, and Coach Thompson, D.C., when I first came here uh, on my visit, it was, a, it was a beautiful spring day. So uh, I remember asking Coach Thompson, is, it, is the weather like this all the time? He said, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so after I signed and I'm here on, uh, uh, here on the campus, I said, Coach, you know, you told me that the weather's going to be like this all the time. You sure don't feel like that. Well, son, he's like, well, son, you signed the letter already. You here, so you good. Yeah. Like I always loved John Thompson. Like he, he was the man. Like he, he retired like two years before I came out, and I was like, man, I wanted to play for him. Just because seeing y'all is just seeing the players that he had from you to AI to Lonzo to the Kimbe, like that history of that. It was like John Thompson was the man. Oh, he was the man, and he still is. You know, uh, I I love playing for him. You know. Um, he gave me an opportunity to grow. He gave me an opportunity to be myself. And he took a lot of heat for that. Uh, he, you know, there's a lot of times when, you know, if people wanted me to do interviews and all these different things that they want player of my stature to do. And I just didn't feel like doing it. 
So he's the one that took the hit for, him, for, for me. So he gave me, he built a wall around me to, and, and then enabled me to grow and become the person that I am. And I, and I, I, I love him for that. At Georgetown in college, you went through wars with some of the best players ever to play the game at a young age. Like, they don't, college ain't like that no more. When we seeing these teams, like, playing every year. You know Georgetown going to be here because you putting multiple years in college. A lot of these guys doing one year and getting up out of here. But back yeah, yeah. in y'all day, like y'all was there, you going to see them again next year if you got past up this year. Oh, like, yeah. some of the wars, like Ralph Sampson, like, you had to play against him and, and Mike in the championship and Lajuan. Like, tell us about some of them, like, wars you went through. We had some great wars. You know, like, it's not like now. You know, you guys did, you guys, y'all went straight. Y'all went straight <laughs> to the league. I, could, I remember y'all young bucks coming in, called me the old man. Hey, old man. <laughs> <laughs> old ass man. Oh, yeah, man. man. But, you know, I, in my era, you know, guys, most of the guys went four years. I know Michael, we, we were in the same class. He left uh, a year early. Now, I was going to leave a year early, but I chose to stay. Charles Barkley left a, a year early. But we had some great battles. You know, we, uh, I had the opportunity to play against Michael, James Worthy, Sam Perkins as a freshman in, in the final game. Unfortunately, we lost, but it was, uh, to me, like my coming out party. That's when the whole world got to see how dominant I could be. Uh, playing against Ralph Sampson on another game, you know, at that time, Ralph was the elite big man uh, in the country. Uh, fortunately, we lost, uh, but, you know, I held my own against him. Then I'm playing against Akeem. You know, both Akeem and I were two of the most dominant big men in college basketball at that time. You know, I was able to win that game, but with my supporting cast. But Akeem, man, he was, he was a beast. Uh, he, was, he was big, he was strong, he was agile, he could do a lot of different things. So, you know, it was, it was, it was definitely a war. But, you know, in my era, uh, the, 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 the uh, college public was able to see us multiple years at, at our university. Uh, so they, we, we created a, a, a bond. But now, you know, the kids are, they, got, they, go on one and, they go one and done, or even now, and now, you know, they have the new G League that's coming out where kids are yeah. going to go straight to the G League instead of going to college. So me as a college coach, we're going to have our work cut out for us to, one, convince these kids that, you know, coming to college is a great thing and, or not going to the G League. Yeah, I was gonna like I was gonna ask you what are your thoughts on that and how how do you see that affecting you guys? Like you guys are one of the blue blood blue blood you know universities that's, that's always been known as a powerhouse and things like that. How do you see that impact and does that change the way you now recruit some of those those five star super super elite one two three guys because you know that a lot of those guys are gonna be gone and what you waste your time and resources trying to get those guys when you think they're going to already already leave and go to the G League route. Well, first of all, you know, you still have to recruit them. You know, I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that, you know, what you just said, Q, that we are one of the, the true blue bloods. We were, Absolutely. We, Absolutely. We were, we were the hunted. A lot of people don't, don't, don't see that. We were better than Duke. We were better, you know, we lost to Carolina, but we were right up there with Carolina. We was right up there with all these, these, these blue bloods. But, you know, it's my goal as a coach to get us back there. Uh, so, you know, it, it's you still have to go after these kids. And when they tell you that, you know, well, coach, you know, we're, we're either going to go to the G League or we're going to choose another route, then you then you back off. But you have to continue to do your, dil your due diligence in trying to, you know, recruit them and, and, and to see if they're going to change their mind and see if they're going to come to your university. But definitely the, uh, the new G League, it's going to be a problem because, you know, you hear all the different the monies that that they're they're putting yeah. into it, and the money that these guys are getting along with shoe deals. So uh, a lot of these top top guys, I think they're going to opt to go that in that direction uh, rather than come to college. What? But what? What do you see the the downfall of that direction? Because yeah, in high school you the man and all that stuff, but when you go to that G League, it's a lot of hungry people, and if you ain't who they say you is, That's your your stock can make you just oh yeah <laughs> well you just hit the needle right on the head you know uh, both you and q was fortunate enough to come out out straight out of high school and, and, and now i went i went to school two okay, years you went a couple years and was still able to be 
to be very good. Not everybody can do that. Like, you know, if people see LeBron, they see Kobe, they see yeah. these guys that, that came straight out and was able to be, to be great and dominant, but not only dominant on the floor, but also, off, but also off the floor. They, 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 you know, they carry themselves as if, as, you know, of, of, as like educated men. You yeah. know? So they were able to, you know, show that, yes, you, you know, our goal is to get an education, teach kids that, you know, you have to be able to handle the things that's going to come with the money. And, but those guys show that, you know, you can still do that. But, you know, you, you go straight to the G League, there's a lot of hungry guys there. There's a, there's a, there's, there's, I don't even know how many guys are in the G League, but everybody's hungry. Everybody's trying to get to the, to the, to the big thing. Yes. So if you not, if you are not ready, you know, you could, you could lose your heart. Yeah. You can just get that one payday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, that 300,000 or whatever they're going to get, it is, that's, that's not going enough to, to carry for a lifetime. Yeah. yeah. They gonna use that three hundred thousand to go to college. <laughs> they ain't use college no more. That's what it's gonna be. <laughs> Amen. So you get you get drafted by the Knicks, and I know the Knicks is in the area. They the most popular team on the East Coast. Like, how is it to be the number one pick? You waited, and you get drafted by the Knicks. But but for you, Pat, you knew as soon as they won the lottery, it was like a yeah. it was a it was a celebration and a parade for him in New York. Like as soon as they won the lottery, it was like whoever won the lottery, Patrick is the prize of the lottery. Of course. So how was that for you to know that you were going to New York? Oh, it was great. You know, um, it's funny because my first the first my first choice was Golden State because Eric Sleepy Floyd, who played with me in college, he was already there. So he was somebody that that I knew and who could take me under his wings. And once they didn't win it, then the, the Knicks was my second choice because you know it's like it was close to DC, it was close to Boston. I had a sister that lived there. I had teammates who played with me at Georgetown was there in New York working on Wall Street. So uh you know that that was uh, another uh you know another great place. Um so my draft day was the lottery like you said. <laughs> because once once uh, the Knicks won, and I see Dave Checkers with my jersey, I knew I was already going. I was, I was already going to go to to the Knicks. Um, yeah. But then we had to, and then we had to uh, negotiate the contract. So that took that took a while. You know, uh, I had to threaten them that I'm gonna go back to grad school. <laughs> all that money that you just you just uh, made from all those season tickets that was just purchased on that same day. You was gonna have to be giving it back, so right. we finally worked the deal out, and I was able to play. Mm. So, so time out, time out. Well, the deal though, the deal was a bag, right? <laughs> I got paid. Well. I got played well. Uh, <laughs> David David Ford did a great job of of, of securing my future. Yeah, <laughs> straight up. <laughs> Straight out. See, that was those was back in the glory days when you could come out as a draft pick and say, "Give me the whole Brinks truck." Now it, it wasn't a slotted, and you know everybody they had to slow it down. Not the big dog held everybody hostage in the, that one year. Hey, but look, I tell you this: I wish I was coming out now with those two hundred, those two hundred and three hundred million dollar deals that they're giving out. That's hey. that's, that's lovely. That's they rolling them joints out. Generational wealth. And you don't got to do half the work that y'all or us had to put in. I know. <laughs> how How is it, like, tell us what, what it means to be a Nick and the responsibility of being a, a Nick. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoyed being a Nick. You know, uh, we, but when I played, unfortunately, they had that guy from out of Chicago that we were trying to fight and go through and beat up to try to get, get to a ring. You know, so he he stopped me from maybe winning one or maybe even two rings. Uh, the year that he got, he went, he came out. I was able to get to the finals, and unfortunately, uh, lose to Houston. But uh, I, I enjoyed being being a Nick. I enjoyed playing for you know Pat Riley, Jeff Van Gundy. You know, we 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 had to we had to work our way up to where we to the to the level that we we got. You know, we started out winning 23 games, then 24 games. Then when Rick Pitino came, we finally made the playoffs. You know, then we took a little a step back. 
Then Pat Riley came and just every, uh, Ernie Grunfeld, Pat Riley, Dave Checkers came and then everything just, just started to fall into line and made it, made it uh, all the fans came back. I remember my first two years in the, with the Knicks, you know, you play the Celtics. Everybody in the garden, they have Celtics gear on. You play the Lakers, everybody has Laker gear on. Then that all changed. Once we started kicking butts and taking names, then, it, you know, even though we, we didn't win a championship, when we went to L.A., all the, all the, uh, all the Knicks fans, they started wearing their right. stuff. When we, go to Boston, when we go to Miami, all these different places where, you know, there, there are Nick people, Nick fans, New York people all over this world. So no matter where you are, you're always going to see a Nick fan. So I was, I was proud to be a Nick, and, and I'm, I still am. Uh, but it was a great experience. Once a Nick, always a Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, every time we play, we play. When I play for the Magic and we coach, we already knew. Every time we went to the garden, I mess with Pat before we go out there. Yeah. I was like, all right now, G, you know, first time out, second time out, one of them time outs, I'm going to come find you so I can get on the jumbo turn with you. When they put you up there and the whole building stand up and they say, once a Nick, always a Nick. Well, it's always good to feel, you know, to feel the love. Um, you know, when when I was there, we had sometimes, me, my, me and the fans, we had uh, some love-hate relationship. But it's good to, you know, for, for them to show me that they appreciated all the things that, that I, I, I tried to do for them. Yeah, no, they, they, they got some of the, you know, they, they fans, we all know how they are, but they got some of the, when they down with you, boy, they can say whatever, but don't bet not nobody else say nothing. Yeah, it'll be a fight. Like, you know what I'm saying? You, we, that's our team. We can say stuff. Y'all can't say nothing. We'll fight about this. Like, that's what I did love about the New York fans. They, they down with you. I want to uh, ask one, one thing, defending the garden. You know, everybody, they want to have their best game in the garden when they play against y'all. So a lot of guys try to come in there and try to give y'all work every home game that they, they seen y'all. Like, how was it, like, defending the garden in the garden crowd? Because this is one of the most famous plays. It was my favorite place to play at. I don't know. Most people's favorite place to play at because they mm -hmm. see players. The garden is like the stage, the number one stage. <laughs> this is your home for 15 it, it, years. This is the crib. Like, how was that? Mecca. It's the Mecca. So, you know, uh, you know, we were good in my era. You know, so it was, you know, they, you give homage to MJ. MJ came and he dropped, you know, 55 against us. Uh, I, I don't know too many other people, you know, dropped that many big numbers on us when we, when we were good uh, in my era. But, you know, and naturally, that was home. So we wanted to definitely protect home court. That's one yeah. of the things we always talked about in the beginning of the year. You always protect home court. You may slip up a little bit on the road, but every time anybody come here in the dish, in, into, uh, in, 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 into Madison Square Garden, we want to make sure that they were going to feel us. You know, Michael was that great that he was able to do that. Other people I know uh, had big games there. But he's the only one that I can remember that was able to score that many points against us uh, at, in New York uh, in my tenure. In my, in my tenure there, I got, I got, I got another New York question. What's your take on how, basically, since since your team has left, they've struggled to get the superstars to, to you know whether it's via free agency or whatever to have the guys like guys. What is your take on? the superstars not wanting to go to the Knicks, so to speak, because they haven't been able to get any of them via free agency. What do you think of that? The last big superstars that that, that are all stars that have come to the Knicks were Amari and, and Amelo. Yeah. They were the last two big ones to come. And, you know, under Mike Woodson, they were the Knicks were doing, you know, doing doing a lot better. They were doing great. Then things change. You know, uh, you know, Phil got rid of uh Mello, Amari left. And then things just seem to start, you know, going the other way, other way. You know, uh, I, you know, KD had an opportunity to come uh, to the Knicks and chose to go to Brooklyn. So it's hard to say what is going on because I'm not there. I'm not living day to day. And plus, my, my focus is on, on Georgetown and try to get us, build us back to where, you know, where we need to be. But, you know, as a, as a Nick, as a, as a Nick fan, you know, uh, I'm sad, and I'm hoping that things will, will turn back around. 
Um, you know, I, I want to see them back back where they need to be, kicking butts and taking names. Pat Riley is one of my favorite NBA legends. And you got the chance to play for Pat Riley, and then you got the chance to see Pat Riley take an organization in Miami and turn into his own little playground. How was it playing for Pat Riley? It was great playing for Pat. Um, you know, Pat, he, he was, when by the time he came to us, he wasn't Pat Riley, the Showtime Laker coach anymore. And, you know, he built uh, the Knicks in, in my image. We were blue collar, we were hard hat. You know, we didn't have Magic Johnson running the break and dishing out those dimes. You know, so we, we had to go about it uh, a different way. So we were going to beat everybody up. We were going to be physical. We were going to be grimy. You know, he's, he, you know, he kept saying, this is how, this, I'm a New York guy. That's how my father was, you know, when he was, uh, when he was working. And that's what, that's what uh, our city, uh, New York, is all about. You know, hardworking, blue, got your hard hat on, your lunch pail. And, and you're trying to, you know, kick butts and take names. So that's the way he built the team. Unfortunately, he was only there, what, three years, three, maybe four years, and then he, he went to Miami. Uh, and the, I remember the first time we played Miami, the first go around we played Miami, it was just like a scrimmage game. You know, they had Lonzo and we had, and you know, and of course the Knicks had me, but we were all running the same plays. Right. We played the same thing. So they come down running floppy, we running floppy. They made it to whatever they call their call. We already knew what it was, so now you have to stop it. But, you know, uh, I, I love playing, uh, playing for, for Pat. He's a great coach. Uh, he's a great role model. Uh, unfortunately, I was disappointed that we didn't win. I was sad when he left. But I thought that when Jeff Van Gundy took over, uh, Jeff Van Gundy still uh, embraced and embodied a lot of the things that Pat Riley uh, taught us. Your jump shot, where did you get your jump shot from? You're a big man that can shoot, had touch. Like, you was dominant, not only just close to the basket, but 15 foot and out. Like, you, that's cash. Like, where did you get your jump shot from? You know, I think that all goes back to the, those guys, and Mr. Jarvis, Mr. Jenkins. They the ones that started teaching me, you know, doing all the different things, you know, bouncing the ball, shooting, and laying in the bed, you know, trying to get the touch. Yeah. Uh, all those things that they taught me when I first started playing helped me to become, you know, the, the player and the shooter that I became. And it's funny because when I now it's 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 great for bigs to be able to shoot jump shots, you know, even out to the three. When I right. first started, they're like, oh, he's 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 too finesse. All he's doing is shooting jump shot. He needs to just get in the paint. I I, I got so much criticism because I was able to shoot, but. If I wasn't able to shoot, I wouldn't have been able to score twenty some thousand points. Right. You know, I'd have been just so uh, so one dimensional, and I was not one dimensional. I could shoot it, I could put it on the floor, get to the cup, I could dunk on you. And I was playing defense. I was blocking shots. I was running the break, getting dunks. So everything that all those guys, Mr. Jarvis, Mr. Jenkins, and all the people that helped me uh, when I first started. Uh, Boo Dalton, uh, they all helped me to, to become the player that I became. And then, you know, Coach Thompson, he had, had the rest and then all the other coaches that I had in the NBA. Tell me about when you found out that there was going to be the dream team and, and that you was going to be a part of the team. And, like, when you found out the players that was going to be on the team, what was your thoughts about being, being, you know, assembling with those guys and going out to be playing the Olympics on with those caliber of players after what you knew about everybody going into it. Well, you know, like I said, you know, I tell I tell people this all the time. So we 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 took a, a couple of steps back in a couple of years in the in the in the Olympics and the World Game. So they call in the seal. <laughs> the seal. We're like, look, they like they were staring at in, in, in the. <laughs> Let the committee like, look, we need to seal. We need to go get that. We need to go seal team. We need to make, <laughs> let, let, let the world know that basketball started on this, on this, in this country. So, you know, myself, Michael, Magic, Larry, all, you know, Carl, Charles, you know, all the guys on, on the team. We, we all knew what we had to do. And it was just a great experience. And it was funny because we all knew we were great players, you know, but it wasn't. You know, you don't know how, how other people outside of this country, you know, think of you until you're, you're actually living it. 
I remember the plane landing uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Spain. And uh, you see thousands and thousands of people just at the airport, lying and screaming. I'm like, oh my God, we we <laughs> rock stars now. We rocking. We rocking. <laughs> <laughs> and to be in another country and see that is just crazy. Yes. Yes. I mean it was it was a great experience. And then, you know, we kicked at the kick bus and took me. But uh, the crazy thing was when against Angola when Charles went and hit the guy, we were like, Charles, what the blank are you doing? You trying to start you trying to start a war? <laughs> That was the, I remember you guys that. Up that whole tournament. Oh yes, he wasn't gonna take no. He wasn't taking no shit. He was gonna <laughs> smack. He was smacking somebody, running over them, forearming them. That's just y'all. Hey, right, tell me this: we all have seen the different clips about the about the how the practices were. How 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 were the practices? How competitive and how high level were they in the beginning? I know things settled down at a certain point, but when you guys first got there, like the practices, how were how was that? It never settled down. It never settled down. When you got, you have Mike, you have Michael, you have Magic, you have Larry. Everybody talking trash, and you know Michael. Michael wanted Larry and 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 Magic to know that it's his turn now. Right. And, you know. Then you know Magic, Michael playing these little you know mind games. You know talking trash to Clyde. He's going at Clyde. You know. Talk, what did he talk, do to Clyde? Huh? What did he do to Clyde? Oh, he just, you know, he, he just wanted Clyde to know that, he, you know, that he, I'm better than you. So he going to talk trash to Clyde, you know, talk, you know, talk trash about them beating them, or, or, you know, when he was at Portland. So, you know, all of those things made it, uh, made it so competitive. And of course, myself and David, we wanted to show that we were still, we were great as well. So we battling each other, Charles going against Carl. You know, my, Magic and Michael, Scotty going against, you know, Magic. You know, Larry, you, his, his back was hurt, so he wasn't uh, doing as much. But everybody out there was just trying to show that they were great enough and good enough to be there and deserve. Uh, I mean, we're all alphas. Right. Everyone on that team was an, was an alpha. So, you know, we, we had to uh, – all of us had to – you know, to step back and, and let Michael and the rest of those guys shine. But you look at that team, we're all alphas. We're all exactly. great. We all knew that we're great. And we all knew that we were great. You played all these years with the Knicks, and then you finally had to play for other teams. Yeah, that was rough. Like, to, to go to, like, Seattle and Orlando and go to these different places and actually live somewhere else outside of, it's all you know is New York. You just right. spent like decade, like <laughs> over a decade. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. This is home, and then like the end of your career, you going to the, how was that like to actually go somewhere else and play? You know, um, in I, in hindsight, I should have stayed, but after fifteen years of hearing the same thing, you know, one from you know rumblings from your teammates or in the media saying that. You know, the Knicks are better off without him. They need to, you know, move on from him. Uh, after 15 years of hearing that, you just got, you just get tired of it. So I got tired of hearing it, and I just thought it was, it was best for me to move on. Um, so I, I went to Seattle. They traded me to Seattle. I agreed to, to, to be traded to Seattle. And, and the funny thing is, after 15 years of hearing from the uh, starting center from the New York Knicks, so every time they, they're announcing the starting lineup, I'm waiting for them to say starting center from the New York Knicks. And they kept saying Seattle Superstar. And then I was like, man, I'm not a Knicks anymore. You're, you're, you're a superstar. So that was weird. And then things didn't work out uh, the way that we thought it would in Seattle. So then I went to Orlando. And it, you know, that was just uh, probably a wrong move. Uh, but I did enjoy living in Florida, like you guys are. The sunshine, you know. It, 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 I used to call my friends when it when when it's be a, it went, when it would be about 70, 80 degrees. I said, "What's the weather in New York uh, today?" They, they start, I said, "Well, I'm I'm sitting out by the pool." So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that part about it, but the 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 playing part I didn't like. I love I enjoyed playing with T Mac. Uh, Darren Armstrong and the guys that we played with, but that was not a very good experience for me because 
Uh, you know, I guess Doc didn't think I could play anymore. Uh, so, I, you know, it, it was hard for me sitting on the bench and knowing that I could play and, and, and believing that I could play, but it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't a good fit at the end. You had a sneaker called the Ewan. Yeah. You used to have the Ewan across the... Yeah. He still got it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still got yeah. the sneaker company called Ewan. That's right. You had, you had your name Ewan across the tongue of the shoe. Like, how is that to have that in this many years to still have it and people still rocking your shoes? It feels great. You know, it's funny because when I first came to the NBA, I signed with Adidas. And then at the end of my second year, uh, because I got hurt my first two seasons, Adidas said that they didn't think I was the player. They didn't, I, wasn't, I didn't turn out to be the player they thought I was going to be. So they decided that they wanted to reduce my money. So I was like, you know what? Forget that. Just pay me off. Cut ties. So they cut ties with me. And then a gentleman by the name of Roberto Mueller came to me with the idea of, of starting my own company, uh, our own company. So he and I became partners and we started uh, the Ewing brand. Uh, and it, we were rocking for a while. Then the, the, the tennis shoe industry went, took, took, a, took a turn. We went out of business. And then an, another gentleman, you know, brought it back to my attention, Ava Goldberg. So now we're back. We, we, we have it again. Um, because of my affiliation at Georgetown, because of, you know, Georgetown is a Jordan school and a Nike school, I had to, you know, uh, uh, put my, my ownership in escrow. So, I, you know, now I'm, I'm basically a, a Jordan. I, I represent Jordan. You like us. You, you down. Yes, okay. You. We all exactly. family. I, you know, I love Mike. I, I tell Mike, just keep on sending the gear. My kids love it, but my shoe is still out there and it's still doing well. Right on. Wow, that's, you got the best of both worlds. It, it, it makes me feel good. Yeah, you got the best of both worlds. Yes, I do. Let me ask you this. Out of all the players that you have play with in the NBA, if you had to pick four players to play with, who would be the four players? That I play with or play against? Play with. Like, out of all your teammates that you have play with, if you had to pick four of them, no matter who they are, well, who would be the four you would play with? Uh, John Starks. Uh, because I love his toughness. Um, you know, he, he worked for everything that he got. Uh, you know, he, had, he played with a chip on his shoulder. Uh, he was a good athlete, a uh, streaky shooter. But, you know, when, you, when you're going to war, and we, we always equate sports to, to war, uh, even though it's not really war, you know, but when you're going to war, that's the kind of dude you want in your foxhole. Somebody that you know, rain, sleet, snow, he gonna be there uh, with you, you know. Oak, uh, Charles Oakley, you know he's he's the hit man. We we played about 10, 12 years together. Physical. Uh, anybody mess with anybody on the team, he gonna be the first one to, to step to them. Uh, so yeah, uh, Larry Johnson, you know, uh, he by the time he came to the Knicks, he, he wasn't uh, this, 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 as grandmama. He wasn't grandmama no more, but he was still. He, re, he, he re, uh, reshaped his game, became a much better three-point shooter, you know, and a, a great leader. Uh, Allen Houston, you know, great shooter. You know what? I, 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 I forgot a point, though. We're going to need somebody to bring the damn ball up. <laughs> you, know, you know, he's a flipper coin. Charlie Ward and Mark Jackson, Derek Humber, you know, all of them were, did something great for us uh, to help us win. I, I want to talk to you about, because I know, you know, you coached me in Orlando, and now for you to be back at, 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 at Georgetown, where it all started for you, how, like, I remember hitting you up when I heard the news, letting you, telling you, you know, you need any help with me, with, with guys or anything, I'm phone call away and just being happy for you. How has that been for you to be back there, like you said, where it all started, then you got the, you know, you got the Jordan deal with the school and you, you know, all of those different things. And just how was that for you to be back there? Oh, it's great. You know, it's, I, it's, it's come full circle. Yeah. I started here as a player, you know, playing for Coach Thompson, giving me an opportunity to, to shine. And now, you know, it's my turn to, to, to lead. You know, as you know, I worked for 15 years to try to be a head coach in the NBA. Yeah. And deserved it. Yeah, and working, deserved it. Working with some great coaches. Stan, Stan Van Gundy, Jeff Van Gundy, Steve Clifford, working along with Sal, Bob Byer, uh, Tom Thibodeau. Um, played for some great coaches. So my, my lineage is, 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 is long. 
So I've worked extremely hard uh, to, to, to get to this uh, position or this point in my life. And it, I, I feel blessed. You know, it's my job now to, to do the same things for, for the, this generation that Coach Thompson did for me. Teach them the game, you know, embrace them, show them love, kick them in the ass when they need to be kicked in the ass, but also <laughs> pat them in the back and let them know I love them. You know, and just teaching them about life. You know, uh, Coach Thompson always, you know, he had a, a ball in his office talking about uh, at some point in, in, in your life, the basketball is going to stop bouncing. And what are you going to do to set yourself up for the next phase or the next chapter in your life? So talking to the kids about that. So I, I feel blessed that um, it's come full circle and I'm here, you know, and I, you, you have your ups and you have your downs. And it doesn't, doesn't anything in life. And I remember my mother and my father always telling me, if it don't kill you, it's going to make you stronger. So we've had our ups and our downs. I've had my ups and I've had my downs. But I think that everything that I've, 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 faced, that, that I've, faced, I've faced in my life, all it's going to do is make me stronger going, on, going forward. When was the, the day where you felt like, oh, I want to be a coach? Like, this is actually something that I, I actually want to do. Like, when that did that come about, like, hey, coach? I, I never wanted to be a coach. Yeah. yeah. I'm saying that now. So I'm like, I don't want to coach. I don't think I got the patience. For That's, that is I, I so funny. <laughs> I never thought of, I, I never thought of being a coach. I remember uh, playing in Orlando and Johnny Davis coming to me and saying, you know, what you gonna do when you finish playing? I'm like, I'm gonna go hang out with my family <laughs> and time, you know, be around my kids. He's like, why, why put all that knowledge on the table? And, that, but, and at that time, I didn't really know what the hell he was talking about. Right, yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm listening to him as the year goes on. And, and then uh, the end of the year comes and I'm sitting, I forgot where Michael and I was at. We were somewhere, I could be in DC here or maybe in New York, we were somewhere having dinner. And Michael Jordan, and uh, you know, I'm saying, you know, we were talking. And he's like, "What are you gonna do now?" I said, "You know, I'm, I'm. Uh, this is my last year. I'm done. I'm gonna try to find something to do. I know I'm still young. I don't want to just go home and waste away. I want to find something else to do." And that's when he brought it to me. He said, "Look, you know, won't you come work for me in Washington?" He was the uh, his work running the Wizards at the time. He's like, why don't you come work for me in Washington? You can either, you know, start a coach, you know, learn from Doug Collins, Johnny Bob, Larry Drew, uh, BJ, uh, uh, and see if you like that. And then if you don't like that, then we move into the front office. Well, I tried coaching and I loved it. I fell in love with it uh, that day. Just seeing, uh, to me, it's, it's like raising your kids. You know, you, you have all your kids. So you're always telling your kids things, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. And a lot of times you're talking to them and it's like it's going in this year and going out the house. <laughs> but then when you're not, when they, you don't, they don't think you're watching and all the things that you're trying to teach them, you see them actually doing it, that's the, that's the joy I get out of coaching. Because sometimes the guy, you're talking to them and they, you don't even know or think that they're listening to what you're, you're trying to teach them. And then you actually see it. So from that at that point, that's when I fell in love with coaching. And now it's been around about 18, 19 years now that I'm still doing it. Straight up. And, that's, that's... and I'm gotten better at it every every year. So every setback I've had in terms of trying to uh, get a head, a head job, the interviews that I've gotten, you know, every no, every no I got, I try to use that as motivation to try to make myself better for the next for the next opportunity. So, so let me ask this. So, Pat, with the way the season and everything ended with the with the coronavirus, what? How have you been doing with your team and like trying to stay in touch? Are your kids at home? Like, where are they? What has been the protocol for you guys? Yes, with with the with the corona, I'm, I'm communicating with everybody, just like I'm communicating with you guys. <laughs> Classes is over now, so making sure that they are, they do you know, get their exams and papers in on time. So everything right now is virtual. So and thing, and until they tell us, you know, guys are able to come back on campus and start summer school, uh, everything right now is, is virtual. So we're doing everything virtual. So we're just trying to make the best out of a bad situation. Everybody talking about, obviously, the last dance and everything <laughs> that's going on with that. What, what, what have your thoughts been on, on the whole last dance and everything and the, and the, and the Bulls and this, this whole documentary? 
Well, you know, uh, like I tell everybody, I've I've not watched a lot of it. I've watched bits and pieces. I've lived through it. Uh, you know, right. I already know how great Michael was. So, <laughs> right. You know, like I said at the start of the show, this man has been beating me for a lot of years, uh, and he 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 definitely lets me know it every time I see him. He always lets me know it that you have never beaten me. But you know, he's a great player. He's a He's a leader, he is, he's, he's a self-motivator, and he tried to motivate his team. Unfortunately, you know, uh, we weren't able to beat him, but the year that he, he, that he had already left, uh, retired and started playing baseball. But, you know, he, there's nothing to say. He's, he's one of the best players to ever play this game. He's the best player to play in my era. And all these things, people are trying to judge who, who's the best of all times. To me, it's hard to tell. You know, Kareem was great. In his time, Dr. J was great. You know, LeBron is great. Kobe was great. All these players, they're all great in their own in their own era. Now, who's the best? I don't know. But the 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 the, the documentary about Michael or, or whatever you want to call it, it's great. It shows you some insights of what went on in, in, in the Bulls organization. But you know, you have to take your hat off to him. He won six championships. You know, a lot of people haven't done that. Bill Russell is uh, Bill Russell has. He has uh, 11. Uh, I think Robert Ori has maybe seven. I'm not sure how many he has. So there's not a lot of people who were able to do that. And he's one of those guys. And he's, and you know, he, he wasn't the, he wasn't uh, a sidekick. He was right. one. You know, everybody knew the ball was coming to him and you, you knew you had to stop him. So right. you got to give him credit. But I got I, all I got to say is that hey look, you guys have come a long way, you know, uh, from the young that I used to I used to uh, be kicking y'all butts and taking y'all taking names talk talk about trash talking. You two for the for some young bucks were the biggest trash talkers that I had ever met. But you know, like I said, you know, we all had things in our life that may may uh, may have not gone the way that we would have liked. But I like to see, I love to see where you guys are now. I love to see the fact that y'all took your lumps and y'all back on top kicking butts and taking names. They keep on talking trash. Oh, hey, man, that mean, you know that means a lot coming from you, OG. No, you that's know, big for us. A lot of love. Lot of love. So that's the wrap, man. We appreciate you, OG. This is this is this is Hall of Fame, 50th all time, 50 greatest players, dream team and Georgetown head coach in the yeah. field. And this has been Pat Ewing with us, man. We appreciate you, OG. You know we got major love for you, man. This was huge. And you know the future. We got nothing but love for both of y'all. And thank y'all for having me on. Yes, sir. <laughs>